Hello, I'm Chloe Regis and a founding member of Extinction Rebellion's literary chapter, Writers Rebel. Our first On the Brink event was dedicated to some of the larger threatened species on the planet. But today we're zooming in on some of the smallest creatures on Earth, insects. Many of us don't spend much time thinking about insects, but we should, because their fate is our fate. In the natural world where everything is connected, when one part collapses, so does the rest. Gradually at first, and then it will all spiral. We've called this evening Insectageddon because what is happening to the insect world is truly apocalyptic. But it's not too late to act and rescue this vital part of the great web of life. I'm delighted to introduce you now to Laline Paul, our compare for the evening. Laline is a novelist, screenwriter, and playwright. Her debut novel, The Bees, is a science-based thriller set in a beehive. It was nominated for the Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction and is being adapted for the stage and virtual reality by the National Theatre. Her second novel, the cli-fi thriller, The Ice, focused on the shady links between business, conservation, and politics in the Arctic. And her most recent novel, Pod, follows the fortunes of two estranged dolphin tribes fighting for survival in a corrupted ocean. She has stood alongside Writers Rebel and Money Rebellion at their protest against fossil fuel lobbyists in London last year. And we're thrilled to have her back with us again tonight. Here's Laline. Unmute, unmute. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I am being hive mind liaison for tonight. And my confession is um, that I have a slightly conflicted relationship with insects. But increasingly, I'm seeing them differently and treating them differently. Uh, we may not like all of them, but we need them to exist. And the facts, which I've only really found out recently, are stark and stunning. So I'm just going to go through a few that have stunned me. Um, insects serve as the base of the food web, eaten by everything from birds to fish. If they decline, everything else will too, says Francisco Sanchez Bayo. If we don't stop the decline, entire ecosystems will collapse from starvation. And John Losey says insects provide literally priceless services to humanity, including plant pollination, in, uh, pollinating three quarters of flowering plants and the crops that make up a third of the world's food supply. And Professor Dave Goulson, from whom we'll be hearing later, who's a renowned bee biologist, says that they are vanishing up to eight times faster than large animals, and that we are witnessing the largest extinction event on Earth since the dinosaurs. It's that big, with 41% of insects facing extinction. No insect, no food, no food, no people. So in Absorbing all these facts, I cycle through the usual denial, ignorance, grief, and arrive yet again at confusion. But thank goodness we don't need to be experts and we don't need to know exactly what to do, which is the reason that Insectageddon is happening now. We have a cast of wonderful writers, biologists, conservationists, tonight discussing what we can do to secure a sustainable future for insects and for ourselves. So I'm very proud to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Erica McAllister. Uh, Dr. McAllister is an entomologist, presenter, senior curator at the Natural History Museum in London and president of the Amateur Entomologist Society. Combining her deep knowledge of flies with a flair for storytelling, her writing dispels many common misconceptions about the insect world and reveals how truly amazing, exotic and important these creatures are in maintaining the balance on earth. She's presented various BBC radio programs and is the author of The Secret Life of Flies, The Inside Out of Flies and the forthcoming children's book, A Bug's World. Erica McAllister, thank you. Thank you, okay. Has everyone seen my screen okay? Yeah. yeah. Good. 
Okay, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Erica McAllister, and I'm one of the many scientists hidden behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum in London. And last week was the first time in many, many months that we were finally able to open up our doors after what has been described as a, a unprecedented global pandemic. Now, to me, it was a huge pandemic, but actually there's a bigger global pandemic going on at the moment, and that is one that all species on this planet are suffering. The human impacts of the environment are so great that we know that more than 40% of um, amphibian species are being impacted, a third of all marine mammal species are being impacted. We see so much data when it comes to the birds, when it comes to the mammals, when it comes to the fish. But actually what we're not quite seeing yet is people paying attention to the smaller, more important drivers of our planet. And that are the insects. So what we got here, this is what we call a species scape. And this shows you the proportion of species on our planet from the flora, the fauna, the bacteria, etc., that has been described. And each, the abundance, the richness of the species is how big these actual animals are represented here. So quite clearly, you can see it's dominated by this insect, and in this case, the flies. Now, I know a lot of people don't like flies, and one of my jobs in life is to convince you all that flies are really important. Now, can you see there? Tiny little deer, that is the representation of mammals. And why I particularly like this photo, this image, this representation, is because there are more species of fly alone in the UK than there are described species of mammal on the planet. So that begins to put in perspective how important these species are. And that, as we were said earlier, they get themselves involved in basically everything. Their little tarsi are in every sort of ecological role that you can think of. So we are now looking at the impact. We haven't got the data um, with a lot of these species. So we have with a lot of mammals, with a lot of birds we've been looking at. But with a few of the species, and I think probably Dave might talk about this later, when it comes to the bees and the hoverflies, there was a really, really good paper that came out that had spent the last, looking at the last 30 years of their decline. And we are seeing it. We're seeing it in the rarest species of the hoverflies, and we're seeing it in the species that live in a more fragile, um, higher uh, regions. So we are specific habitats, such as the uplands, which are quite fragile. We're luckily, with a lot of our crops, we have some good news, and that is not just good news for our crops, but I'll get onto it in a bit. But we are a huge loss going on with our species. And this is because of us. We're now in the Anthropocene. Okay, we've finally acknowledged we are causing massive devastation from invasive species to pesticides and climate change to habitat change to habitat loss. This was a field I walked through a couple of weeks ago. This was a devastating moment of walking through huge agricultural fields. And it's not just the loss of land to the insects, but also you are losing areas which are insects which are helping us, the pollinators and the predators, um, to get rid of all those crop, uh, the ones that are attacking all the crops. So we're increasing more pesticides. So we're having a double impact on all the species, thanks to having agro ecosystems like this. We are bringing new species, thanks to us migrating everywhere and us importing loads of different things. We're importing some very negative species. These are two invasive species that are in my garden. So I can see the impacts of these already. The oak processionary moss is causing a problem. But it's not just the impact on our health that we have to worry about, it's the impact on other species. This is a tiny, I know it's not a good photo, don't laugh at the photo. In fact, we don't have any photos of it. It's a wingless fly, yes they exist. And this is found in Hawaii. And this fly is now extinct because of an introduced ant. But does it really matter that these flies are going extinct. For example, let's move across to another island. We're in the Azores here, and there's a mosquito. And we're a bit worried about this mosquito. <laughs> You're like, hey, why do we have to worry about a mosquito? What earth does a mosquito do apart from annoy us? There's one here we have more data on, and we know actually this is being threatened, and this is because of habitat loss. And again, it's a black fly. They're really bad, they bite us. Why should we want to care about flies? 
we look at climate change. Climate change is having a huge impact and it's going to be having an impact more. Um, we're going to have wetter winter the, or wetter. I mean, this is a lovely May. It's a brilliant example how wet things can get. And we're going to have localised flooding and we're going to have all sorts of impacts. And this is going to impact upon our highland um, and our upland species. This is a really strange fly, okay? These are called net-winged midges and they're so distinctive. They're only alive as adults for maybe one week and the male spends all his time flying around flirting with the ladies. But this, these are really vulnerable because their larvae live in these upland streams in very, very finite temperature zones. If we start changing the temperature, we're losing these species. But again, it's a fly, should we care? This fly is a horse fly. We think it's now extinct. But if anyone ever been bitten by a horse fly, nobody's gonna care about a horse fly. Surely there's no point worrying. This is one of my favorite little flies. Yes, I know it doesn't really look like a fly. It's called a terrible hairy fly. I think you can see why we've called it a terrible hairy fly. But it's a wingless fly and it's arguably one of the most endangered species on the planet because it is found from one cave in Kenya. It specialises is on bat faeces. So it's called quite an extreme diet. But again, is it important? Why should we care? And we should care because flies are arguably the most ecologically diverse group of animals on the planet. You name it, they do it from predators to parasites, parasitoids, all through this list. And very importantly, they're pollinators. You enjoy your cup of tea, you enjoy biting into chocolate, you need flies for those. We have some really enigmatic species in our own gardens everywhere. This is a beautiful bee fly, and it's got a really long mouth part. We call these fluffy flying narwhals, because they co-evolved along with lots of plants to get in and pollinate where a lot of other species can't. And this is taken to some extremes. Look at this one. If this was a human, its tongue would be six meters long. But it's, it's a very important pollinator. And they, along with those horse flies that we didn't like, have gilled pollinators in some really ex important regions, such as South Africa. Some of the hoverflies migrate. And in migrating vast distances, we're gonna hear about some other migrators earlier, they're able to spread the pollen around. So they're really good for plant genetics. And this one is even better because this one's larvae eats loads of crops. That one little larvae there eats 400 aphids before it becomes an adult. We're really important little species. This hoverfly, it's larvae. A, it's brilliant because it breathes out of its bottom and therefore you should save it anyway just for that. But it eats the decomposing waste. So it's recycling. So we've got predators, we've got pollinators, we've got recyclers. And a lot of strange plants have co-evolved with them. This is a plant that pretends it's a rotting corpse. It definitely smelt like that. And so you have all these flies going into different environments that we don't think about, such as the Arctic, where we talk about ecosystems and how all these function. So many birds and other species depend on flies. Of the 4,000 species of insect described in the Arctic, half of them are flies. So, most of them oops, most of them are just names in the collection of all the described species most of them we don't know anything about and this is our problem we have to quickly we have to learn we have to study we have to understand the functionality within all our ecosystems and we've got to act we've got to do it fast we've got to make sure that we don't destroy most of our planet all of our habitats leave your gardens by creating that little patch of wildlife by leaving that one dandelion you'll be embracing the charismatic megafauna. Thank you. That was, am I, am I back on? Can you hear me? Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you, Erica. I think what you're, what you're making me think of is the paradigm shift about flies and their place in the world. And you said some amazing things about, you know, like we should finally acknowledge what we're doing, which made me think, we need a truth and reconciliation committee for nature, but that's another story. Um, so um, it's now a great pleasure to introduce author, sorry, I just have to move my screen over a tiny bit, uh, to introduce author and another friend of Writers Rebel, Jay Griffiths, who will be discussing literature and activism. 
Jay is an award-winning writer who's worked on the politics of time. Her book, Pip Pip, is amazing. The Importance of Wildness, Wild, which is where I started with her, and The Natural World in Childhood, Kith. She's written for E.ON, for the BBC, for Radiohead, and for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And her most recent book, Why Rebel, can you see that? Is brilliant. That's all I'll say. Get it, read it. It will encourage and inspire you. Uh, John Berger wrote of her, if bravery itself could write, it would write like she does. Or to paraphrase, she's a warrior queen and I'm delighted to introduce her now, Jay. Thank you so much, Laleen, thank you. Imagine if our food were brought to us by dedicated and almost invisible angels. Imagine them flying effortless and iridescent with a beauty more extraordinary than any art of ours can ever replicate. Imagine if those mysterious beings worked freely to keep alive almost the entire living world, including birds, animals, and ourselves, offering us a myriad of flowers and the feast on feast of exuberant life. Imagine if these angels also gently and tactfully disposed of the dead, unobtrusively cleaning corpses, tucking the dead back into the deep bed of earth so they can re-become life in another form. Without insects, we would wade through corpses with every step we took. I wish that everyone who said they believed in angels would actually believe in insects. They do not take the title of angels, being by nature bashful and unassuming. They go by other names, firefly, bee, and caddisfly. But we humans, it seems, value irreal angels more than the priceless reality of insects. A secret commonwealth, the insect realm encompasses more species than we have identified. The insects, hallowed be thy names, some of which are pure poetry. The orchid bee, coloured in bronze and ultramarine, purple and gold, the ladybird, the glass-winged butterfly, the emerald swallowtail, hidden in their very multitudes. Insects are together a gigantic collective of kindness, dancing in constant attendance to living things. Pollinating three quarters of our food crop and 80% of wild flowering plants, keeping the soil healthy. From their actions flow the countless forms of life, from apple blossom to bread and roses and the silver salmon, everything that has ever flowered and ever will. And from physical life flows everything to be treasured in human life, from existence itself to the highest of the arts. It is ultimately thanks to the insects that we have not just the flowering of plants, but the flowering of culture. Michelangelo salutes them, Notre Dame bows in thanks. No insects, no Mozart, no art, no music, no beauty, no love. Imagining a world without wings fills me with inconsolable sorrow. A wren, hungry and songless, a swift dropping to its death, the air emptied of life. Without insects and birds, we rob ourselves of all that flight represents the wings of mind, the flight of imagination, that mother of empathy. To them we owe everything, my life and yours and yours and yours. Without them we would lose the gold day, dust gecko, the thorny dragon, the sea turtle. But what is the point of listing what would be lost? We would lose, to put it bluntly, almost everything. Starvation would stalk the land for almost every kind of creature, including ourselves. Please tell me you understand the immensity of this. And if maybe you don't, please think, alone and quietly perhaps, of the unfolding ending. Let me speak simply into the simplicity of your heart and let me just ask you, what you love, what makes you happy? Is it a child? Is it your partner? Do you love your friend or little prince? Do you love your rose? Do you love your dog, your cat, your church, your home, your garden, your books, the poetry you make, the music? And this love then, this happiness that you hold so dear, tell me how it will even exist without the tiniest of beings 
against which we have been so utterly pitiless. It was the studies of insect collapse reported late in 2018 that first made me cry for insects. The horror of it swept over me and I cried for three days. I hate all kinds of bullying. And the fact that the insects are the tiniest creatures bullied by humans acting as monsters gave the facts an edge of very personal pain. But it was, of course, infinitely more than this. I saw in one awful moment a vision of the desolated world, a devastated wasteland. I don't want to be lyrical now. I just want to swear. The collective stupidity renders all my craft useless. What right is art? can ever convey the vast, deadly and deliberate slaughter with all its consequences that are in some the sum of it all, the everything. Where to go with this gigantic stupidity? What the fuck did we think we were doing and why the fuck are we still doing it? Intensive agriculture is killing us by killing the insects. If I sent a tweet, I would write only this. Mass use of insecticides leads to mass death of insects. And I'm like, duh, who knew? Insecticides should be made illegal overnight. Every scrap of land turned to organic agriculture. Every shred of mental energy requisitioned for love, essentially, the love of life. Writers sometimes tell their readers when they struggle for words, when they experience a writer's block, or when their psyches demand a fallow period. That admission is a touching one. It's a truth so precious, I do not use it lightly. But I use it now. The magnitude of this situation silences me. The words I lean towards are not enough. Tears, maybe, the raw scream of rage and pity, perhaps. But what words do you suggest I use here? Annihilation, the end of worlds, the last generation, absolute apocalypse. If you were looking this full in the face, what expresses it sufficiently? And a savage anger overcomes me. This is not a game. Nature is not a hobby. It's the life on which we depend. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Jay. Um, I just made a note. When I, when I saw your book, I loved the quote on the back, nature is not a hobby. And also, you know, what an incredible, undeniable manifesto for love. Thank you very much, Jay. So um, there are some totemic creatures that we instinctively love more than others. Um, Erica, you have explained that we don't love flies enough. And you're right, I'm sure. Um, other, other insects are easier to read. And so in the marine and animal worlds, you've got the charismatic megafauna, tigers, eagles, elephants, polar bears, whales, dolphins, sharks. But in the insect world, I think it might be a tie between bees and butterflies. And we love butterflies, not just for their beauty, but also for the mystery of their transformation, which seems to speak so directly to our souls. And perhaps is the reason that butterflies are universally loved and they don't even have a weapon to sting with like a bee. Now, the extraordinary migratory monarch butterfly is now threatened with extinction. And we're about to hear from two of its most eloquent champions, Ava Arigis and Terry Tempest Williams. Ava is an award-winning Mexican-American filmmaker who's directed six feature films and also written on Narcos Mexico and other TV shows. Her novella Monarca, about a teenage girl's magical transformation into a monarch butterfly, was co-written with Leopoldo Gaut and will be published by Harper Collins in 2022 and sounds fantastic. Terry Tempest Williams is the American writer, educator, conservationist and activist whose work focuses on social and environmental justice and who got name checked by Bill Clinton for moving the needle. She is the author of more than 18 books, including the environmental literature classic, Refuge, An Unnatural History of Family and Place. And her most recent book, Erosion, Essays of Undoing, has just been released in paperback. Terry lives with her husband, Brooke, in Castle Valley, Utah, and is on the board of the Center for Biological Diversity. 
So Ava is going to speak first on the real and present dangers facing this amazing butterfly, the monarch butterfly. And then Terry will speak about how this extraordinary insect has influenced her, her own life. So Ava, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my first encounter with the monarch butterflies was in Michoacan, Mexico, where the Eastern population spends every winter. Um, and my father, Homero Aritis, who's a, a poet and environmentalist, grew up in Michoacan. So he grew up as a boy watching the butterflies come to his village uh, every November and spend you know, 120 days there until March. And so when my sister and I were children, we went and, and would see this, you know, glorious spectacle, one of the wonders of the natural world. Um, and so I've, I've had a, a love for these butterflies since I was a child. And um, I just co-wrote this book last year and spent you know, the past year immersed in, in um, studying this, this wondrous creature, the largest migra you know, in the insect world, the one that undertakes the largest migration um, up to 3000 miles every winter. Um, so the North American monarch butterfly population can be divided into two groups the much larger as a more populous Eastern population, which originates in Canada or the United States East of the Rocky Mountain Range and overwinters in Mexico and the Western population, which originates in Northwestern US and overwinters at 200 different roosting sites in California along the coast, going from the Bay Area down to Baja California. Uh, both populations have been in steady decline over the past 25 years. Uh, the Eastern population numbers have dropped a staggering 85% from a billion to less than 60 million. And the Western population's migration have dropped an even more devastating 99.9%. .9 in 1997, the number of butterflies over in wintering in California was 1.2 million. By 2019, it was 29,000. And last year in 2020, not even 2,000 were counted. So it's very possible that this is the last year that the Western population will exist. It's usually only the, uh, the fourth generation of Eastern monarchs that, that migrate to Mexico. Uh, they arrive there in October, early November, spend the winter there, head back north in, in early March and quickly mate and lay their eggs on milkweed in the southern United States before dying. And then it's um, their offspring, the, which is the first generation, which head back north. The second one also heads north. And the third generation usually does not migrate. The Eastern monarch is affected by a myriad of issues in the US, Canada, and Mexico. The Western monarch is mostly affected by issues in the United States. Uh, the main issue in the United States is the loss of milkweed the sole food source for the monarch caterpillar and the only plant a monarch will lay her eggs on. Urbanization and adverse land management have led to a steady decline in its availability with 165 million acres of monarch habitat, an era the size of Texas, lost over the past 20 years. Widespread use of insecticides and herbicides used to control both insects and weeds have destroyed milkweed plants in much of the remaining habitat. The glyphosate-based herbicide Roundup produced by Monsanto and Bayer um, and used all over the Midwest kills every plant doused with it except those that are genetically engineered to tolerate it. Some 850 million milkweed plants uh, or 71% of the monarch's support infrastructure have vanished from corn and soybean fields all over the US in the past two decades. And climate change leads to for forest fires and drought particularly in California and the Western states, which also leads to less milkweed while heat waves can cause monarch eggs to not hatch. Monarchs also encounter many physical obstacles during the course of their migration. Uh, some get caught over the Great Lakes and drowns, others are killed in storm. Some are destroyed by the wind, but the single largest cause of monarch mortality 
um, when it comes to accidents is roadways. Uh, so 25 million monarchs die in the U.S. and Mexico every single year and they're run over by cars and trucks or get caught in the windshields and grills. Once the monarchs arrive in Michoacan, after their 2,500, 3,000 mile long journey, their struggles are far from over. An estimated 10% of the overwintering population are eaten by predator birds and mammals every winter, and one bad winter storm can kill millions. But the biggest fish issue facing monarchs in Mexico is illegal logging and the destruction of their winter habitat. The tree-covered mountains of central Mexico provide the perfect microclimate for these butterflies. Uh, they spend the winter sheltered in the branches of the Oyamo fir trees. It's warm enough for them not to freeze, but it's not so warm that they become active and reproduce, uh, resume their reproductive cycle too early. Uh, the fir forests, which once covered this whole region, only represent uh, less than 0.5% of the land now, so not even 1%. In 1986, at the urging of my father, Homero Regis, the Mexican government decreed the creation of the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve and 40,000 acres in Michoacan and uh, Mexican state of Mexico. 2000, it was expanded to 140,000 acres. But logging has continued in both the protected and unprotected areas. Um, logging is done by commercial loggers with sawmills and trucks, and also small-scale small -scale logging is conducted by locals using the trees for firewood or building purposes. Farmers have also been expanding their fields onto the slopes of the mountains and the cattle trample and eat the furred seedling. But most recently it's avocado farming that has presented the biggest threat. Avocados originated in Mexico over 10,000 years ago and today 80% of the avocados in the United States come from Michoacan. Known as green gold due to the high prices they fetch and the high demand for them, um, the booming industry has been brutal for Mexico's oak and pine forests. Both these forests and avocados grow at the exact same altitude of 5,000 to 7,000 feet. And between 1974 and 2011, about 110,000 acres of forest across Michoacan's central highlands were turned into avocado orchards. Uh, Americans eat seven pounds of avocado per year per person on average, up from three pounds in 2003, and Mexico's environmental watchdog, the Federal Attorney General for My Environmental Protection, tur often turns a blind eye to the illegal logging. Um, drug cartels and other powerful interests have ties to this lucrative trade. So local officials are either scared of the, the dealer, the drug dealers, um, they're threatened, or they become compliant food bribes. And in addition to fueling the deforestation, um, the avocado farming is also consuming much of the local water supply. So what can we do to help these magnificent butterflies? Uh, the first and foremost action we can take in North America is to plant milkweed and wildflowers for them. This can be done in our backyards, in local parks, schools, churchyards, university campuses, museums. Um, even on rooftops or in flower pots on your balcony. Uh, research which varieties of milkweed and wildflowers are native to your area. Decide if you'd like to use seeds or plants. If purchasing plants, choose ones that haven't been treated with pesticides. Also think long-term. Pollinators need nectar in the spring, summer, and into the fall. And monarchs love a variety of flowers. Zinnias, marigolds, asters, avas, goldenrods, Mexican sunflowers, Miss Molly bush, lantana, and more. Meanwhile, milkweed is essential for monarchs to lay eggs on and for caterpillars to feed on starting in March throughout the summer. Habitat restoration and plantings for butterflies are effective anywhere they breed or pass through while migrating. And privately owned ranches and farms between Canada and Mexico can enroll in conservation pro programs to provide food, breeding and resting spots for them. It's preferable to not plant milkweed and wildflower for butterflies near roads, but if this is the only habitat available, it, it's better than nothing. Everyone around the world can urge the US Fish and Wildlife Service to list monarch as an endangered species. Monarchs need immediate protection. This designation would lead to a comprehensive recovery plan and funding to restore their habitat and ensure their survival. In addition, please urge the Mexican government to protect the monarch butterfly reserves from destructive avocado trade, and urge all governments to ban herbicides like Monsanto's Roundup. 
Petitions for All can be found online and should be shared on the greater impact. If you can find and afford them, only consume organic equal exchange avocados from Mexico. Uh, these are produced by organic farmers uh, in areas which do not contribute to deforestation. Urge your grocery store to sell these and to boycott commercially grown ones. And lastly, teach your children to respect the earth and its non-human inhabitants. How much of the natural world will still be here by the time they have grown up depends on us. And very soon it will depend on them as well. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. I actually nearly cried um, listening to that. And, and also, may I commend you for an extraordinary piece of research, which you delivered brilliantly. Uh, so much there to research and Google after this event. But um, yeah, very sobering and very important. Thank you again. So now, Terry Tempest Williams is going to talk about the monarch butterfly in her life. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. And I want to echo my gratitude, Ava, for your beautiful thoughts and passion. Um, I owe so much to you and your wondrous family of Homero and Betty, and of course, Chloe. Mm -hmm. For it was Homero with his love of monarchs who shared his passion with us, members of El Grupo de Cien. In 1994, we traveled to his home ground of Morelia to witness them. And I found this entry from my journal, quote, orange wings flapping in the darkness, monarch butterflies are migrating across North America, south to the creases in the mountains of central Mexico, Mijucan. They fly 15,000 feet above the earth to Sierra Pallone, an active transvolcanic range, orange, black. Monarchs wear the topography of flowing lava on their wings. The butterfly's final destination was a secret, not discovered by the lepidopterists until 1974. Of course, the locals knew, but they never told anyone that 40 million monarchs were perched on the mountaintops above their village, opening and closing their wings in private conversation. I'm walking up a mountain along a steep, thin path. The path is dry and dusty. There are burning fields, cleared fields, from logging and farming that appear as quilted squares on the steep hillsides, gullies cut deep from rains, exposing red soil, erosion. A few monarchs are sipping nectar from roadside flowers, some called senecio. We pass men on the trail who remove monarchs from the path. They pick them up, blow the dust off their wings, and place them in sunlight, safe from foot traffic. This is their job. This is their work. I stop. I think I hear rain. We continue walking until the forest darkens, cools. Suddenly, we look up through a canopy of wings, wings fanning the air, creating the sound of rain, the sound of wind. It is the sound of wings, butterfly wings. The fir trees are laying down their arms. Here, now, millions of monarchs hang from the trees, like frost-bitten leaves, the underside of their wings exposed, burnished, and bronzed. We are now dressed in butterflies. The longer we stay inside the winged forest, the more we see and hear, the settling of peace. And then the sun appears from behind a cloud. The peace is ruptured in a frenzy of flight. The forest is ablaze with monarchs, winged flames reaching upward. Here we stand, in the mind of God, a friend says. Here we stand in the beating heart of earth, I reply. Why must we leave? We walk back down the mountain. I trip on an exposed root. My foot falls on a butterfly. I have killed a butterfly. A woman from the village walking with me bends down, picks up the still alive with cradled hands and brings the monarch to her mouth. And with one quick pop, of her breath blows it back to life. In a miracle, it flies. Silo de vida, she says. Now, more than 25 years later, if only it was that simple. 
On August 28th of last year in 2020, it rained in Fargo, North Dakota, but it was not a generative rain. It was a rain of thousands of dead monarch butterflies on the sidewalks, streets, and playgrounds in this Midwestern city. Residents awoke to what they called a monarch massacre and spoke of picking up hundreds of fallen monarchs. Children were being asked at their elementary schools during recess to pick up the winged bodies in stacks of 25 monarch butterflies at a time. The cause of deaths, a routine mosquito abatement program carried out in the middle of the monarch migration by city officials who said, we didn't know there are some insects that are dead, but rest assured there was a, absolutely no change in the protocol of spraying parathern. Same chemical, they said, same product, same airplane, same process and procedures we've used for the past 10 years, unquote. The city official called it, quote, an unfortunate side effect, unquote. What is the side effect of children stacking the bodies of monarchs on their playground? What is the side effect of grief? When a generation earlier, children were known to look out the window of their apartment buildings and witness the wonder and awe of millions of monarchs flying through Manhattan. Or in rural America, when children were accompanied to school with monarch butterflies floating along their side while walking through fields of milkweed. As Eva mentioned, in January of this year, during the 24th Western Monarch Count, nearly 100 volunteers donned their masks and masks in the middle of a pandemic to carefully survey groves of trees on the California and Northern Baja coast for monarchs. They surveyed 246 sites. Sadly, to their surprise and demise, dismay, only 1,914 monarchs were counted, a shocking 99.9% .9 decline since the 1980s. Counts from 2017 to 2019 were around 30,000. Now a year later, barely 2,000 individuals. We are in fact, as Jay reminded us, witnessing the rapid collapse of the Western migration of insects, and in this case, monarch butterflies. Monarchs now flutter on the threshold of extinction. A migration of millions of monarchs reduced to 2,000 in a few decades. Where is our outrage? Where is our grief? How do we put our love into action? And can we love this beautiful broken world enough to change? Who are we as a species if we allow monarch butterflies, a living symbol of metamorphosis, to cease to exist? They are torchbearers of beauty who still fly above us. Homero Arrigas writes in his poem, to a monarch butterfly. You who go through the day like a winged tiger, burning as you fly, tell me what supernatural life is painted on your wings so that after this life, I may see you in my night. Eva? <laughs> Um, tú que vas por el día como un tigre alado, quemándote en tu vuelo, dime qué vida sobrenatural está pintada en tus alas para que después de esta vida pueda verte en mi noche. Ah, I think, uh, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Eva. Um, it's really hard to know what to say, isn't it? It's really hard to know the outrage, the grief, the statistics. I mean, that's why we're here. And I feel all those things right now. Um, how do we put our love into action? That's such a powerful thing to say, Terry. And I am actually tearing up. So I'm going to go into introducing our next section. Um which is about a more famously threatened insect, the honeybee, uh, for which Isabella Rossellini has been campaigning for over a decade. I didn't realize that. Uh, excuse me while I just pull this up a little bit more. Uh, 
So we know her as the celebrated Italian American actress, but she's uh, and model. Uh, but she's also a philanthropist and committed environmental activist. She's the creator and star of the brilliantly funny and sexy series about insect sexual behavior called Green Porno, which is such a treat, and you can Google it all later, and has devised the smallest, cir smallest circus in the world, which is a stage play exploring animal intelligence. She lives on her vegetarian farm in Long Island, from where she sent us uh, a video, which we're about to see, after which we will have the treat of a little bit of green porno. So she's not right here now, but Isabella Rossellini, what a heroine. Just for the one that is unclear, pollinator really means uh, somebody that mates for you. Plants don't move, therefore they need insects, like bees, to pollinate. Bees land on flowers, collecting sperm and eggs of plant, and then they go to another flower, distributing eggs and sperm. That's why they are essential, because without them mating on the behalf of plant, plant would die. Now bees, I'm a beekeeper, and bees are fierce. Look at my foot and what they did the other day when they discovered a little piece of their skin uh, exposed, they bite me. But I kind of admire the bees. Not only I love their honey, but I admire their fierceness. If I were a bee, a queen bee, I would be very fat and do nothing else but lay eggs. The unfertilized eggs will hatch my sons, the fertilized eggs will hatch my daughters. If I were a daughter, I would be sterile and I would do all the work. I would have antennas to help me hear and pads on my feet to smell. I would have compound eyes to see everywhere, and I would be armed with a stinger for the fence. I have many sisters, and I communicate with them by dancing. I tell them where the flowers are. To one of my little sisters, I would feed the royal jelly that would make her fertile, and one day, she will become the queen. If I were a male bee, I wouldn't have a father, and I will be called a drone. I would have many brothers, and we would do nothing, just waiting to have sex. A female ready to mate. Sex! And we brother would fight! I'm the strongest. I would fly after her. I would mate her in flight. It's our nuptial flight, but pulling out from her, oh, my penis would break off. It would get stuck in her vagina like a cork in a bottle, but it would prevent other males from mating with her. She will be queen. She would start a new colony with my babies, but I would die without my penis. I would bleed to death. Memorable, isn't it? Um, and very funny. Anyway, thank you, Isabella Rossellini, a heroine for many reasons. Now, earlier I mentioned Professor Dave Goulson, uh, someone who's done so much to alert the world to the damage that the loss of insects is doing to our ecosystems. He is Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex, specialising in bee ecology, and has published more than 300 science, 
scientific articles on the ecology and conservation of bumblebees and other insects. And his books combine fascinating scientific fact and serious biology with entertaining prose. If you've yet to read him, you could start with bumblebees, their behavior, ecology and conservation, or else a sting in the tail, both of which I highly recommend. Professor Goulson founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust in 2006, a charity which now numbers 12,000 members. And in 2015, he was named number eight in BBC Wildlife Magazine's list of the top 50 most influential people in conservation. He is a trustee of Pesticide Action Network and an ambassador for the UK Wildlife Trusts. I think it's true to say he's something of a rock star in the world of bee biology, though he might not describe himself like that. And it's my pleasure to introduce him now, Professor Dave Goulson. Thank you, Laleen. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure this evening to talk about bees, which are something of my favourite subject. I've been studying bees for about 30 years now, and I consider myself very lucky that people pay me to run around chasing after bees. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about them. I, I've, I've only got a few minutes and there's so much I could talk about. Um, but let's start at the beginning. So bees uh, evolved over 100 million years ago, back in the age of the, the dinosaurs, uh, when our ancestors were little rat-like creatures scurrying about. Um, bees are actually... Um, they, essentially, they evolved from wasps. Their wasps turned um, vegetarian. Uh, some distant uh, ancient wasp that previously fed its offspring on um, paralyzed insects or spiders decided to use pollen instead and, and essentially became the first bee. Um, and they're, they're really, to this day, the only insects that specialize in feeding on pollen and nectar throughout their lives. There are lots of insects that as adults visit flowers, usually for the nectar. Um, but bees as adults, they collect the pollen and the nectar and, and, and take it back to a nest for their offspring to eat. So, so they consume pollen and nectar from, from when they're an egg um, to, to the day they die. Well, not they don't consume as an egg, from when they hatch from their egg. Uh, and they've evolved lots of uh, adaptations to make them very good at, at finding flowers, at locating the rewards and extracting them and so on, including the fur, which is the primary um, reason bees have fur, is to um, act like a brush to, to gather up the pollen as they visit flowers. And you can see uh, this, this bee has done so well at that that it can barely fly. It's absolutely coated in, in pollen. Um, and as they move from flower to flower, they accidentally spill a few grains of pollen and that pollinates the flower, um, which I'll come back to in, in a moment. Uh, now, Isabella talked about the honeybee, uh, which, is, which is one species of bee and it's the most familiar species of bee, but it is just the sort of tip of the bee iceberg. It is just one of over 20,000 species globally. So I thought it would be nice to just to say, show you some, some pictures of different bees. Uh, so we have the bumblebees, which are actually the ones I focus on studying. And then there are lovely solitary bees, like the hairy-footed flower bee, isn't that cute, with his hairy feet? And leafcutter bees, and mining bees, and longhorn bees, and wool carder bees, and cuckoo bees, and that's a, a mason bee. And then look at that, isn't that an amazing creature from China? That's a type of carpenter bee, the blue carpenter bee. And then another of my favourites, the orchid bees from Central and South America, which are like little metallic flying jewels, gorgeous little things. We shouldn't forget, actually, when I, I mentioned pollination, um, it isn't just bees that pollinate. It's actually a host of insects get in on the act. And Erica wouldn't, wouldn't forgive me if I didn't mention flies, for example, as really important pollinators. But then there's also butterflies and wasps and uh, moths and beetles. And so just in the United Kingdom, it's estimated there are more than 4,000 species of insect involved in, in pollination. And between them all, globally, um, they pollinate more than 80% of all the plant species on our planet. So if we didn't have these little pollinators, then 
most of the plants uh, would disappear. They wouldn't produce seed and eventually um, would, would die out, uh, which obviously would have absolutely catastrophic consequences. And as well as wildflowers, of course, these pollinating insects pollinate our, our crops. Um, so roughly three quarters of all the crops we grow in the world um, depend to some extent on insect pollinators. So we've grown used to our supermarkets being chock full of this sort of amazing selection of, of fruit and veg, um, often flown in from all over the world and available for 12 months of the year. Um, take away the, uh, the insects and things wouldn't look so good. We wouldn't have a whole host of lovely fruit and veg. We wouldn't have strawberries or raspberries or blueberries or apples or cherries or courgettes, pumpkins, tomatoes, chili peppers, I could go on and on. Um, even, even coffee and chocolate depend upon insect pollinators. So life would be dire indeed without them. And actually the horrible truth is that, is that millions of people would starve to death if we didn't have them. So, so we absolutely have to look after them. And we should be really worried um, by the, the evidence that they're declining. Um, now, at this point, I could give you lots of examples, lots of studies, but I just thought I'd sh show you one species which I absolutely love. It's a, a type of bumblebee called the shrill carder. It has a, it's called that because it has a, an unusually high-pitched buzz as it flies, so you can actually, with a bit of practice, you often hear them before you see them. Anyway, in, in the UK, this used to be quite a common bee, as you can see, scattered all over England and and bits of Wales. Um, that's pre-1960. That's between 1960 and 1980. And that's uh, post-2000. This species is rapidly disappearing and is in imminent danger of extinction. And this is a process that's still happening. So when I, I first went looking for this bee um, in uh, the early part of this century, um, I found them on Salisbury Plain. It's one of, it was one of six populations left in the UK. That's Salisbury Plain there. That population has gone just in the last few years. So from six populations, we're now down to five populations. And the one there on the Somerset levels is teetering on the edge of extinction. We've only seen one or two bees in the last few years. So then we'll be down to four. So this bee is, is dying out before our eyes, um, which, which I, is terribly depressing and we need to do something about it. We need to make sure we don't end up like these people. Um, these are images taken from southwest China where people now have to hand pollinate their uh, apple and pear trees because there are, there are too few pollinators left to do it for them. They send their children climbing up into the, the higher branches. Um, it's, it's a terrifying prospect and it's actually real. It's happening right now. We need to make sure this doesn't spread around the world. One solution to the pollination crisis that's been suggested is that we should build robot bees to replace them. Um, and this has been taken quite seriously by some people. There are at least five uh, research labs, robotics labs in the world, building robot bees right now. Uh, I guess it's an interesting exercise. Can you replace bees with little robots? But I, I wish people weren't taking this seriously because I think actually it's completely nuts in terms of the practicalities. Um, just imagine, you know, how the resources it would require. There are right now, at any one time, estimated to be about three trillion honeybees on the planet. So are we really, and that's just one species of pollinator, are we really going to build three trillion little robots? Imagine how much plastic and the metals and energy that would require, and they're going to break down and litter the countryside when it rains or whatever. Or worst case scenario, imagine Vladimir Putin's computer hackers breaking into the B-Bot control system and turning them against us. Um, it seems ridiculous when we have real bees, which have been pollinating for over 100 million years. They're really good at it. They're carbon neutral. They're self-replicating. They're biodegradable. They have every property you would want in a pollinator. And it seems to me we would be far better off looking after the real thing. And that would probably be much cheaper and more sensible than planning for their demise by building their replacements. So we have to do better. If you want to know more about what I think we can do, I have a new book coming out, Silent Earth, Averting the Insect Apocalypse. It seems to me that a great place to start in 
uh, in looking after our planet better is for us all to get involved in looking after these little creatures that live all around us. Thank you very much. Right, back. Um, God, I'm you know, horse puffing after each speaker. Dave, that was fantastic. And Putin takes over the bee bot. You heard it from the horse's mouth. You heard it from Professor Dave Goulson first. So it seems completely crazy that we are spending so much money on trying to get into space and we're not spending it here on Earth. Uh, that, again, is something for another time. The whole event feels a bit surreal, doesn't it? Insect again, that we're here because insects are facing extinction. Uh, I'm feeling so upset, so angry, and so glad that this is happening and that I'm a part of it. And Silent Earth by Dave Goulson is the book we all need to be buying. Um, okay, so now we have the poet Daisy Lafarge, uh, who will be sharing a new work inspired by Maria Sibylla Merian, or Maria Sibylla Merian, a 17th century German female naturalist and illustrator, and the first person to depict metamorphosis. Daisy was born in Hastings, studied at the University of Edinburgh, and her poetry collection, Life Without Air, was published by Granta Books in 2020 and shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. And I had a Google and a YouTube of Daisy earlier today, and it's really great. I recommend. Her visual work has been exhibited in galleries such as the Tate, St. Ives and Talbot Rice Gallery. And her debut novel, Paul, won the Betty Trask Award in 2019 before it was even published, which is amazing and will be published next year. Congratulations, Daisy, that is fantastic. And over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me and to the other writers for these um, incredible and also quite devastating um, talks. Um, the contribution that I'm gonna share this evening um, concerns the artist and scientist, Maria Sibylla Merian, um, who's often considered to be the mother of entomology. Um, so it's more of an historical overview of her life, but I hope that you will find her work on um, insect behavior and ecology as inspiring and motivating um, as I do. Um, and I'd hope to have some images to share with you of her work, um, which may or may not appear as I'm speaking. Um, but if not, then I'm going to share this um, unsatisfactory <laughs> picture on my phone of these beautiful, um, large illustrations that she made. One, egg. In a life cycle, we tend to begin with the egg, even though the egg indicates the existence of the being that laid it. We begin with the egg laid on a leaf which becomes food for the life that hatches on its surface. Perhaps it seems strange to eat the ground that holds you, but the distinction between habitat and diet is often blurred and itinerant, the wriggling line of a larva that hatched while we were distracted. Maria Sibeya Marion was born on the 2nd of April in 1647. The leaf she hatched on was the city of Frankfurt, where she was instructed in painting by her stepfather, Jacob Morel, a master of the Dutch Golden Age. Jacob painted the century's infamous tulips, while 13-year-old Maria took to raising silkworms, staying up all night to watch them hatch. Two, caterpillar. The larva enters its feeding stage. Maria grows up and begins to publish illustrated books with luscious plates of flowers and insects. Unlike her painter contemporaries who used insects as decorative additions to their work, Maria was devoted to intense study of the creatures she painted. Her first two volume book on insects is concerned with studies of metamorphosis considered to be the first of their kind. In the 17th century, nature was known to be fickle 
but it seemed that few before Maria had stuck around for long enough to watch nature's capricious transformations take place. She joined a radical Labadist commune where individual property metamorphosed into communal wealth. It was there she first saw a preserved insect from Suriname. Although also unlike her painter contemporaries, she wanted to work from life, not specimens. She was uninterested in the representation of dead objects, but compelled by the rhythms of life itself. Three, Chrysalis. Many aspects of Maria's work, her devotion to studying insect habitat and behavior remained in a chrysalis, waiting 200 years for the word ecology to be coined and the virtuosic scope of her life's work to be understood. But in the meantime, she catered to exotic tastes to get by, producing books on the flora and insect fauna of Suriname. While Europe was at the parasitic apex of colonialism, Maria was among the first to depict insect parasitism, a phenomenon she described as false changes upon watching a swarm of flies hatch unexpectedly from the body of a caterpillar. These false changes contradicted the ancient concept of spontaneous generation, the notion that life emerges spontaneously from non-life. Her observations demonstrate the acuity of attention. Maggots may gather in rotting meat, but that doesn't mean that decaying flesh is a point of origin. Better to attend to the whole cycle, Maria knew, than to draw logic from its isolated parts. Four, adult. In a life cycle, we tend to end with the adult the reproductive stage that tips us into beginning again. But now it seems necessary to add a fifth or final stage, the stage of extinction, which jams the cycle indefinitely. What is a cycle that stops revolving? Perhaps it's the preserved specimen that Maria knew wasn't and shouldn't ever be enough. She had no car windows spattered with insects with which to gauge declining populations. But her devotion to metamorphosis tells us that like the legacy of her own work, it is never too late to change. Thank you. Um, Daisy. Fantastic. So interesting. Thank you so much. And how wonderful that you have a mentor from the 17th century <laughs> in this amazing woman who I will be finding out more about, uh, Maria Sibylla Meriam. 17th century, that's just incredible. What a woman she must have been. Um, okay, so now we're going to return to Chloe Arigis from Writers Rebel. And Chloe has a particular interest in animal rights and biodiversity loss. I mean, God, don't we all, but she knows a lot about it. A Mexican writer based in London, she's the author of three novels, The Book of Clouds, Asunder, and Sea Monsters. And she's also been a guest curator at Tate Liverpool. In 2014, she was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and more recently, the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. I'm incredibly impressed and have just ordered sea monsters from my local bookshop. Chloe is here to speak to and with Kim Stallwood, the author and acclaimed animal rights activist and speaker. Kim has more than 40 years of personal commitment and professional experience in leadership positions with some of the world's foremost animal advocacy organizations, particularly in the UK and the USA. He's European director of the Animals and Society Institute, an animal rights think tank, and was executive editor of the Animals Agenda, an animals rights magazine, and is the editor of Speaking Out for Animals, and a primer on animal rights. It's a pleasure for me to introduce in conversation Kim Stallwood and Chloe Arigis. Yeah, well, I'm very happy now to uh, open, widen the focus a little. Um, 
Um, so we've been speaking about insects and where that fits in to larger conversation about the rights of nature and all living mm. beings. Um, and um, I feel this past year or two, especially one lives under the mantra of um, action is the antidote to despair. And I think, um, so I'm very excited now to be um, speaking to Kim Stallwood. And um, before I ask you further questions, could you tell us how you became an activist and um, where it's taken you? Where did it all begin? Well, Chloe, um, it all began in a chicken slaughterhouse. Uh, it was the summer of 1973 when I was a student. And as a result of working in this chicken slaughterhouse, I became a vegetarian on the 1st of January 1974. And then two years later, I became a vegan after I was exposed to all the arguments in support of becoming a vegan. And then since then, since 1976, I've had a, a number of, of positions with various organizations, primarily in the USA and the, US, in the UK. And more recently, I work as a, as a consultant with uh, various groups, and I am an independent scholar, and I'm working on uh, a project to do with writing the biography of an elephant called Topsy. And if anyone knows anything about Topsy, Topsy is the elephant who was electrocuted to death in 1903 on Coney Island. The other project that I'm involved with is preserving the history of the animal rights movement, which includes um, my own archive, which is at the British Library um, that was accepted there last year. Okay, yeah. Um, could you tell us, for those who don't, I mean, probably many uh, of our people joining us today would know, but could you explain what the whole notion of speciesism and um, how destructive it's been um, for other species and for most other species, and also where would insects fit into that spectrum? Mm. Well, I see a moral and political struggle against a network of interconnected oppressions. This struggle, which is based on an assumption of superiority, challenges the domination, inequity, and exploitation of others that subjugates them. We're familiar with sexism, racism, heterosexism, and other forms of oppression, but I see speciesism as sitting alongside them. Speciesism is our discrimination against or exploitation of, of animals, uh, other animals, I should say, because we are animals ourselves. And insects are also caught up, as we've been hearing tonight, in this network of interconnected oppressions. We don't value their lives. We routinely kill them individually in our homes and use chemicals to mass slaughter them. Mm. And there's also, our, our species also seems to create this false hierarchy between, um, say, dogs and pigs, and we treat them so differently, even though, of course, they're, um, they both feel and think uh, very similar levels. Yeah, I think that uh, with, with many thanks to the internet, in fact, I think that people are increasingly being educated through watching films that people are posting onto the internet, how much other animals are like us. And, you know, we can watch the videos of the, I remember one in, that's coming to mind right now of a dog and a, and a chicken chasing each other around, I think, some bales of hay. And at one point, they all stop and go in the opposite direction. And they're having a great time playing with each other. And I kind of think, well, how many times do we have to see videos of this kind which demonstrate animals that their sentiency, their sense of fun, their sense of play, their intelligence, how many times do we have to see them before we really recognize that, that they are like us, similarly but differently, but they are like us? And that we, our, our relationship with them is such that is, is there are some very lucky animals who we live with and very lucky animals who we care for, but there are billions of others who we just treat as disposable commodities. And all the billions of chickens, all the, the countless billions of fish that people eat, they are all individuals who, who deserve their own rightful place to be able to exist on the planet. And this is the, what we're hearing tonight is about insects, but it is also true of many other 
species uh, as, as well. And do you think most people have to, I mean, to us, after listening to all these all the wonderful talks, but do you think for most people, they have to, there has to be some sort of love of insects even to protect them and the distance that one feels that most people feel from them um, leads them leads people to treat them so badly. And as we've said, it's the most dispensable. There's a really interesting um, uh, struggle, if you like, between loving animals and believing that animals have rights. Yeah. I mean, when I got involved with uh, this issue, I, was, I never would have considered myself to be an animal lover. I felt that the rights of animals was essentially a political issue, that they are individuals who, who are entitled to their own uh, rights and protections in as much as that we are also uh, entitled to them. But it wasn't, in fact, until I was adopted by a chihuahua who, who was a, who's in need of living in a home who adopted me, <laughs> and I had no choice but to, to live with him. He taught me that I was actually sort of, a, if you like, a closeted animal lover. And ever since then, I have quite welcomed the uh, description of, of calling myself an animal lover. And um, there are a lot of animal rights people who do not like do not like the phrase animal lover because of its connotations. And I understand that. But I think that there are many people involved with animal rights who are closeted animal lovers because they, because very often they live with many cats and dogs and other rescued animals themselves. But I think also people who we traditionally think of as animal lovers, they are in a way closeted animal rights people because the, they understand that their own cats and dogs um, have rights, they share their homes with them, but we just need to make that species leap to see that other species, um, the ones that might, whose carcasses might live in our fridge, that they are also uh, sentient beings who deserve uh, treatment far better than what we're giving them at the moment. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on the government's latest animal sentience bill? I mean, well, it's government. interesting, yeah, that the UK government has introduced an animal sentience bill. I think it's generally welcomed, but I've yet to be convinced of the government's commitment to implement legislation that will, in a meaningful way, address the consequences of legally recognising animal sentience. I want to hear more from the government about the areas of animal use and abuse it will make illegal and how they will be prohibited by effective law enforcement. I also want the legislation to seriously address insects, given how essential they are for a healthy planet. Mm. So, by um, starting with not lifting certain bans, neonicotinoid bans. Exactly, yes. Um, uh, I'm sure the government is going to withstand efforts to want to sort of talk about bees in, in, a, in a bill to do with animal sentiency, but everything is interrelated and interconnected and we cannot separate these things out. So I guess the final question, which um, most speakers have had uh, their own thoughts too, is how, how would you say we can help insects and all animals? What steps can everyone take now, today, tomorrow? Well, I think there are many things that people can do, and a, a couple that I would like to highlight. Our first is to talk to our elected representatives about the climate crisis, help them to develop public policy and pass legislation, join a political party, get involved and stand for election. But then also buy organic or locally produced food whenever possible. And from window boxes to gardens, we can grow food, buddy up with friends and neighbours to rent an allotment from your local council. Start turning your vegetable and fruit kitchen waste into rich compost. But I think the most important step I believe everyone can take is to go vegan. Food grown for direct human consumption uses less energy, water, and causes less damage to the environment. Raising, killing, and processing animals for food makes no economic or ecological sense. If we truly want to help insects, I believe we must become vegans. It's the only practical and ethical way forward. Okay. Wow. What a great conversation, which I could have um, listened to you both talking for a lot longer and some huge 
ideas which are not new, but they always feel so radical. You know, when we're talking about the domination and exploitation of other creatures, uh, well, you know, we can look at our own world and see that happening. So we have a great big mess to sort out. And um, it also made me think, Kim and Chloe, of the Al Gore film, An Inconvenient Truth, because what you were talking about is true, but it's so radical and it involves metamorphosis. And that's a word we've been hearing a lot about. So um, before we finish up, I'd like to welcome Simon Bramwell to say a few words. And Simon is a co-founder of Rising Up, Extinction Rebellion, and advocate for what remains of our wild nature and has been many things, a bushcraft instructor, a nature educator, a grave digger, and a carer. In his own words, he's something of a hedge witch and is happier with goats than humans. Simon Bramwell, not in jail at the moment, welcome. Thank you very much indeed there, Lillian. And yeah, welcome to me. And thank you very much for inviting me on uh, this evening. I'd just like to put a quick shout out as well to Larch Maxi, who's just been freed from prison after being on remand for his actions uh, in trying to stop HS2, which is a little bit like Britain's own Amazon uh, and is destroying woodland, it's destroying precious habitats up and down the country. And of course, along with the more well-known speeches like owls and badgers and all the rest of it, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of insects as well. So just a big shout out to Larch. Um, I also do apologize if I seem a bit flat. I've uh, just had my COVID vaccination, so I'm feeling a little bit under the weather at the moment. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, a thought, um, and it's around words. Uh, I get quite uh, angry and frustrated when we use the word lost species. We are not losing these species. They're not down the back of the sofa. They're not in a box in our garages. They are being destroyed. And we say insect species are under significant threat. Uh, and yet it's not a threat. It's a promise. It's a cast iron guarantee of our uh, industrialized civilizations, ecocidal appetites and addictions. And uh, words are important. Uh, obviously, you all know that you're writers. They hold power and meanings that we often ignore or forget. And part of our mission here, if you will, is to, is to break spells with words and to, to break glamours that we've had uh, put around us and that we put around ourselves. So I would say this is not a threat. Um, it is a promise of mass extinction unless we act, unless we resist, and unless we disobey, essentially. My first taste of disobedience, beyond disobe disobeying my immediate family, came early for me, aged about five. Walking to school one day with my friends, we came across two male stag beetles uh, in the street. I'm not sure if everyone knows what a stag beetle is. They're beautiful members of the, uh, and I'll try to say this properly in front of all the bloody scientists, uh, Luke and I Day family. Uh, and they're our biggest beetle, and beetles perform like such so much thankless and essential work in our ecosystems. Anyhow, um, instead of going to school like obedient drones, uh, we stayed to marvel at these kind of like jeweled, magnificently iridescent, mythic looking beings engaged in a grapple around mating rights or food. And we marveled, we fell in love as kids do immediately, and we dawdled, and we were late for school, and we were told off by teachers and shamed in front of our class, which obviously is like quite a dire sin at such a young age. Um, it was worth every single moment, and since then I've, I've long loved the beetle as, as an insect. 
Uh, in my own grief, it's been over 25 years uh, since I've seen a stag beetle in the wild, in my wanderings around the British countryside or in like the home counties. They are on the endangered list. And yeah, it's coming on my bucket list to happen across one before I die or indeed before I'm uh, put in jail again. Um, okay. For me, the highest function of ecology is the understanding of consequences. I'll just repeat that. The highest function of ecology is the understanding of consequences. If we are going to survive the next 40 years of species, we must all become ecologists, must all begin to understand consequence in a profoundly connected and deeper fashion. In our kind of current hubris of mass-produced consumer convenience, we have largely divorced ourselves from many things, erected a lot of barriers between us and these astonishing beauty and complexity of our natural world. And as a result, we've shut out a lot of the consequences. Now here we are on the edge of this precipice of mass extinction and we have an opportunity and we have a choice of whether or not to become truly intimate with those profound consequences and the truth of these dark times. Uh, it's my belief that only by embracing these consequences, only by taking full responsibility for them, can we hope to make lasting change and that, can that change can actually take root in our societies. Of course, such, such intimacy requires sacrifice, um, just as falling in love requires sacrifice and the knowledge that heartbreak inevitably emerges from love. Uh, as writers, you might know that the, the term sacrifice derives from the Latin sacrificium, which is a combination of the words sacer, meaning something that's set apart from the secular or the profane for the divine or the supernatural, uh, and facia, meaning to make, to make sacred, to set something aside for the sacred. Um, so one of the most fundamental things we need to sacrifice, in my opinion, is humanity's hubris that we lie at the centre of the web of life. This conceit is central to the catastrophe we now face, a catastrophe that we have created through massive wanton arrogance and, and uh, disregard for the web of life around us. Um, the, the biologist J.B.S. Haldane uh, has perhaps one of my most favourite quotes in the history of uh, naturalist sort of ecologists attributed to him, and it's somewhat apocryphal uh, in many people's respects. And Erica, you might be able to put me right on this one as well, <laughs> nodding ahead. Um, but apparently it was asked of him if there was anything that could be concluded about God from the study of natural history. And he replied, it would be that God has an inordinate fondness for beetles because there are so many different types of beetle on the planet. In a way, if you take this uh, quote uh, as any kind of meaning or truthfulness to it, um, it's asking us to consider that perhaps humans aren't at the centre of the web of life, that perhaps we aren't made in God's image, that it's not all about us. So unless we consider this, unless we make these sacrifices now, unless we rebel against this kind of reckless arrogance that our species is showing, we, of course, we stand to lose everything. Our natural world, our children's futures, our history, our culture, our lives. And this is already happening to, to countless tens of thousands of people right now in the global south, of course, as well. And, of course, the puddles of life, as it were, the puddles of this beautiful biodiversity are drying up around the planet in regards to other species, right as we're speaking. Um, we will, I also believe, in a very almost spiritual way, perhaps, to lose our humanity beyond the kind of mere scientific definition of the word. But we are nothing without all our relations, nothing without these thousands and thousands of species 
around us, defining and interrelating and letting us know who we are. Without bird, without mammal, and of course, without the insects, which are so fundamental to the health of this planet. We only are because we dwell amongst those relationships, not at the center of them, but along with them. If we destroy those relationships, we lose our humanity and we lose essentially maybe our souls along with them. And then we will dwell at the center of nothing uh, and taste only ashes. And for me, that in this moment in time is unacceptable. So here I am essentially, um, and I'm also making a little bit of an invite to you guys as well and to everyone out there, and also especially to you writers, to make sacrifice, to consider what sacrifice needs to be made in your lives on behalf of the lives of others, on behalf of the future, on behalf of nature, and on behalf of those teeming multitudes of insects that are dwindling around the planet as we speak. Um, so uh, if Isabella was with us in person, I may be asking her to go and smash the windows of Monsanto naked I think, that would be, I think that would be a green porno I'd be well up for. Um, the easiest place to start, though, might be right at, at your own doorsteps as writers, uh, lobbying your publishers to only use 100% post-consumer recycled paper instead of the kind of virgin pulp forests that are being grown and unfortunately then cut down to make our books, but also they're taking so many ecosystems along with them. Um, so lobby your publishers, uh, lobby your faculties. If you're a uh, professor or a scientist, get them to stop using these things, refuse to publish even. And I know that might be quite controversial, refuse to bloody publish unless they change, unless they have meaningful pl transition plans in, chase in place that aren't just the kind of FSC, forest stewardship kind of council, bullshit greenwash that they are now. The effect on our insect populations from publishing, again, with the cumulative effect of everything else, is massive. Um, and over the coming decades, the global book industry is on track to sweep through woodlands more than four times the size of Wales. And that's up to like a staggering 3.4 billion trees, according to uh, a friend of mine, um, according to more calculations. Paper's impact is greater than the following industries. Uh, so like waste and landfilling, chemical production, fuel and power for commercial buildings and steel, aluminium and iron production combined. This is our society. This is the impact we have on our day-to-day -day lives. So in that respect, organize, make change, occupy the offices, throw paint over their doors, block their distribution plants. Maybe you don't have to get arrested, maybe you can't, but maybe you can. Risk your reputations, your livelihoods, as others are doing right now. Make sacrifice for nature, affect change, and one of the largest things we must learn to do is to cease to be complicit with this promise of murder and mass extinction that was unleashed upon the planet. We literally have only now, we've got a very short time to turn this around in. And we are often amidst the confusion and the grief lulled back into this sense of normalcy until we learn that the monarch butterfly or the Western monarch butterfly might be no more this year. So in whatever way you can, just take action. Where you are, wherever you are, however you can. And that's about me. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, what a rousing call not just to action but to love and to care and to feel and if we start feeling and our our imagination is engaged and our hearts are engaged 
then we are stronger and we are encouraged. Our hearts are stronger. And um, my 22-year-old daughter gave me these wings to wear tonight and has just sent me a question, which is, how can we bring more kindness into the world? Mm. And that is the big question. Um, so I can't answer that in the time we have left. I certainly can't answer it. But I would like to on behalf of Writers Rebel and everyone here. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers this evening. Um, the amazing Chloe Aregis, Dr. Erica McAllister, uh, Jay Griffiths, the Warrior Queen, Ava Aregis, who blew me away with the Monarchs, Terry Tempest Williams, who made me cry, probably other people too, Isabella Rossellini, Professor Dave Goulson, Daisy Lafarge, Kim Stallwood, and Simon Bramwell. That was so meaningful, important, and I'm so glad to have, to have been a part of it. And let me finish, please, by going back to two of our favorite insects, uh, the butterfly and the bee. And we've heard the words metamorphosis a lot, dominion, um, transformation. And the butterfly starts life as a very hungry caterpillar. And its metamorphosis is a kind of death. Sealed in its chrysalis, its body turns into a kind of protein soup, except for the cluster of cells, which I believe are known as imaginal disks, an incredibly poetic term that grabbed me. And these imaginal disks hold the genetic data, the blueprint for the butterfly to come. Now the transformation happens in lockdown in a tightly sealed, strict lockdown of the chrysalis. And when it's time, when the butterfly is complete, it breaks free and it doesn't go back to normal. There is no new normal. There is a radically changed new life and flight. And uh, so that's the butterfly I wanted to talk about. And secondly, I want to show you something that I spotted in this weekend's Financial Times, and I hope you can see it. Can you, can you see it, anyone? Is it showing? There, is it showing? Go back. Go back, go back, go back. Go, go back. forward. Forward. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was nice. Okay, I'll tell yeah. you what it is. It's yes. A, it's a, a picture of a honeybee, and it says, industrialist. Uh, for a Swiss wealth management firm. And call me naive, call it greenwashing, but I believe that this is a sign of hope. And necessity is the mother of evolution. And I do believe that at the 11th hour, 59th minute, 58th second, I don't know what the proportion is, that enlightened self-interest is the hot new emerging market. And Nature is now being explicitly numerically valued. We still can't put a price on a honeybee or a worm. These creatures are priceless, but it's a start that nature is worth money. And that is now being talked about. She's not a shareholder at the table yet, not even a minority shareholder, but it is our job to get her there with our voices, with our activism, with our wallets, with our votes, with our letters to our MPs, with our pain in the arseness of not going away and keeping these painful things and these beautiful thoughts going. So thank you everyone uh, in the hive mind out there for being part of Insectageddon and good night.